Lord, we will sing and shout that victory. Lord, there is a day coming when um, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a glorious day that will be. Lord, we see this clock ticking and that clock is speeding up exponentially and the day is coming and coming soon when we will see your glory. God, in the, in the air, we will meet you there. God, what an amazing day that shall be. Father in heaven, please stir in us a wonderful urgency that Jesus Christ is coming soon, that this whole world is just being put into place, all of the players, all of the evil being allowed to rule and reign over this world, but yet, God, you restrain it, you restrain it through your Holy Spirit in us. So Father, may we be the salt of the earth, preserving this world and holding it back, Lord, not allowing the devil, the principalities, the powers to convince us or deceive us or dilute us into thinking that we have no power over them because it's only, it's only the threats, it's only the fears that control us. So I pray, God, that we would have boldness in these days, God, to live a life of urgency, live a life of fervency, to live a life that is steadfast in trusting in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Lord, that you would glorify your name today. Lord, you would glorify it through your word, and you would just bless us. Lord, do prepare our hearts and minds for communion this morning, and that it would just be a blessed time of knowing, God, that you have ministered to us. Help us, God, to trust you with all of our ability, all of our soul and mind and heart and our strength. May it be all surrendered to you, not as Saul we see so often. We see a good example of Saul today, King Saul. But God, help us not to rely on Saul, but to rely on the greater than him, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 11. It's a great chapter. Let's take a look at it. Uh, it, It's an interesting chapter. We've seen last week that Samuel and Saul, uh, this, this divine meeting together, and uh, Saul is now um, this desired guy. He's big in his own eyes, uh, but, but he's, he's doing all right. We won't get ahead of it. Let me, let me just see where's that at. Um, for, I just remembered something I wanted to look up. Um, He's following along. We see he's not necessarily uh, a a God-centered person. He he has um, the jury's out, right? (laughs) We we saw that he he followed along and and he allowed all of these testimonies, these witnesses, to happen. uh, That he it all unfolded just as the prophet Samuel had told him. You're going to run into these people, this, that, and the other thing, and it's going to just all happened just like I said. So Saul had every reason to believe in God and to trust that he was actually being anointed as the king over Israel. And Israel, in a short period of time, will become the superpower. They are the most prominent nation uh, for a short period of time under David and Solomon. And they are a powerful, glorious nation. And it's pretty cool, and he gets to be the first king to lead the way. Remember, the, the donkey leads the way in this procession, and remember that uh, the donkey would lead, lead the camels, the camels of all these kings being led, and then Jesus rides in. I just like that. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on that donkey, finalizing the procession of the kings because he is that great king of kings and lord of lords. Well, When we finished up last week, one of the final verses in chapter 10 said, Saul went home to Gibeah, a valiant and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. But some rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presence, but he held his peace. Remember, um, Saul, the son of Kish, uh, Kish, I forget even what it means now, um, probably... Uh, not the, ba- the best guy, and uh, like I said last week, you know, kind of like the perfect politician family. Um, so when they said, can anybody's son be a prophet now, right? Uh, that was an interesting thing when, when Saul prophesied. So these people, they knew Saul, and they didn't believe in the changing power of God. Uh, God can change people from the inside out, amen. 
He can save us and sanctify us and free us from whatever we have done or what has been done to us in our lives. And God can create in us, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation. That's God's hope for each and every one of us. Thankfully, he says uh, also in 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that he who has begun this thing, he also will do it. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 also. Wonderful stuff that the, that the Bible uh, reminds us. Uh, but Saul was given a new heart. God changed him. And we see that he is surrounded now. Some of the people are revived in verse 26. Valiant people surrounded Saul. And they are ready to go, hey, God is moving. God is in the midst. He is doing something. You see, they still were under opposition from the ites, right? The Canaanites, Perizzites, all those, all those Perizzites, parasites that are in the land, those you supers that God said, um, you should rush, just push them out of the land. Wherever you put your foot, Joshua, I will give you that land, remember? And, and Joshua, a foreshadow of Jesus Christ, we're not praying for an inheritance of the land of America because we're American Christians. We are the promise of God. We are the inheritance of God because Christ has moved in us and we are uh, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that we are the holy of holies. Okay, Ooh, this is pretty far out. So it's not about land, it's about the promises in us and us possessing the promises in ourselves. And so these Old Testament illustrations are here to give us an illustration of these things, of the mortification of the flesh. As I said in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, whatever that was, oh, 7, that there's a such one. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. All of these things are illustrations for us to put the flesh into subjection, that God's Holy Spirit can live within us. All right, so we have valiant men around Saul. We have naysayers saying, <laughs> Saul? They despised him, all right? And so God is going to do something now. He'll do this with King David. He does this in our own lives at times when God calls us to a ministry or something and each one of us is called to some sort of responsibility in either getting the gospel out in word or supporting whatever, whatever that is. Oftentimes the worst naysayer in our life is us, right? That we just go, ah, not me. Okay, uh, we need to be valiant we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, have a new heart, and trust that God is calling us to do more, right? He wants to do more in us than we could ever ask or imagine. And it's glorious, and he wants to reward it for eternity. It's so cool. But sometimes the valiancy is not there, and, and it's just because sometimes we haven't had the experience. So God, and sometimes we just we just don't see God as big enough in our eyes, and that's, that's why he allows these things. So anyway, God is going to prove that Saul is now the king, and we see some interesting things in this whole narrative. So with that being said, let's just jump into it. Chapter 11 in 1 Samuel, then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up, against, uh, came up and, and camped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this one condition I will make a covenant with you, that I may put out, the King James says, thrust out your right eye and bring reproach on all Israel. So he's got some sort of vendetta he not only wants to take control of this area, Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh means dry. That's a dry land. We can, only, we can only imply why it might be dry. But this man comes against him. He's an Ammonite. The Ammonites should have been pushed out of the land. They should have been. They were, they were not part of God's inheritance in, in the land of Israel. And God said, you push them out and they will leave. Uh, but here we have a man who's risen up with some power, Nahash. And he's an Ammonite. And he not only wants to make a covenant with them and control the people of Jabesh Gilead, he wants to put out the men's right eye. And he wants to do it not only to make them subservient to him. I can't imagine. You know, that would be like, all right, so, hey, what's the deal? You know, how do, how do we enter into this covenant? And it's like, let me poke your eye out with a hot stick. And it's like, ah, I really don't like that, the idea of that. 
I've, I've, I've put a stick in my own eye before, and I, I did not like it, and my eye stayed there. Something caught on fire one time, and I'm running around, and I just, you know, and just boom, the stick in your eye, and you're like, oh, that really helps. <laughs> One-eyed, no water, something's on fire, and uh, uh, yes, okay. And, uh, you know, it's, well, I imagine he would use a hot stick, so I'm glad it wasn't a hot stick in, in my eye. But, you know, you just go, that's not helping. How do I... How do I defend myself? The idea is um, most men are right-handed, so their shield would be in their left. And as arrows and things are coming, you're looking with your right eye and protecting the majority of your head. And so he's saying you have to expose your whole face um, to, to battle. And so it's, it's a way of saying, you know, Adonai Bezek in, in the day of the, the kings, was it? Or was it judges? He would cut off the thumbs of all of those who he defeated, so they could not wield a sword any longer. He was devolving them instead of evolving, right? Get rid of their opposable thumb. So it was just a way to say, you can still work your crops, you can still bring me um, a, uh, a, a tax, or however you want to say that, um, be subservient, but you cannot rebel efficiently against me. And they find themselves in a situation that is very, very uncomfortable. Poke your eyes out. And then, and then he says, though, to bring reproach on all Israel. And it kind of makes us wonder, well, how, would, how would this one town of Jabesh Gilead become a reproach on all Israel? Then, verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, hold off for seven days. They're standing there with her. Hey, let's, uh, let's talk about this for a minute. Please, if you would, hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So they make this ultimatum. All right, can you give us seven days to, to think on this? Now, it's interesting that Nahash is like, yeah, I'll give you a whole week. He must know something from this, this narrative that is, uh, that is hidden in the scriptures or in history. And he is willing to say, I will give you seven days. Right, because if, if I had seven days, I'd be like, all right, I, I'm not that smart, but I'm going to make myself an atomic weapon right now. I'm going I'm to find a way to get all, all of my people safe and not lose my right eye, right? But the, the alternative is not come out and make a treaty, and he comes through and wipes you all out. So the backstory on this is uh, in Judges chapter 20 and 21, there's a vignette that's just disgusting. It's terrible. It's horrible. There's a man who's concubine. Uh, the men came after him uh, from the town of Gibeah. The young men of, of uh, or the disgusting men, the yucky men. That's what I have in my notes there. The yucky men of Gibeah. They come and they go to attack this man. And instead of taking him, they take his concubine and they abuse her to death. And so um, this is bad. So they take now this concubine's body. And this is in the days of Judges, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes, right? That's how the book of Judges ended, ends in, in Judges uh, 20, 21, verse 25. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, and there's no king in the land in those days. So now God is changing that. He's bringing the pr progression to a king to be an illustration of the king of kings, Jesus, who will be the king who ultimately will rule and reign over his land, Israel. And so... In the days of Judges, this horrible thing happens, and then to, to bring the, the 12 tribes together, excuse me, the 11 tribes together, uh, they, this man takes and he cuts up the concubine and he sends portions of her to the different tribes and says, we need to talk about this. Israel is reprobate. This is horrible. And so he, he volleys right back with a reprobate action, just a disgusting thing. It's terrible. And so in those days... The people came together, and they went to uh, Gibeah in the tribe of Benjamin, and they said, Benjamin, hand over these terrible men. And they said, no, we're going to defend these terrible men. And so in that, a civil war breaks out in Israel over a horrible event. Civil war breaks out, you know, the, uh, Sin News Network is there, and they, they play just the footage that stirs everyone, and groups start up, and we, we can see that things haven't changed much. And so a, a war in Israel is happening because they wouldn't hand over these sick men who did this thing. And so a civil war begins, 
and uh, the tribes of Israel, they say, 10 out of every 100. Let's, every town, every city, let's go there and let's muster up men. And uh, Benjamin had several. Benjamin is defending these evil men of Gibeah. And they have several of these men. It says that they were skilled, uh, super skilled fighters. And they could, they, with their sling, they could split a hair at whatever distance it was. They were like, they were good, right? And so these guys are good and they're waiting in ambush and battles break out. And I think God at this time in the book of Judges was culling out a lot of the bad apples. The people who died were men who were ready to take the sword, right? There's just violence in some people. A lot of people died. Israel goes, uh, all of Israel goes against Benjamin, and Benjamin uh, kills several different people. And so um, the end of this battle happens, and then Israel comes to their senses, and they go, wow, we have gone to Gibeah now, and these mighty men, they went out, and so then, you know, they tricked them, and the, the third time out that they go to battle, God says to go, go one more time. They trick them, and they go out into the field, and they get taken, and, uh, and Israel wins, and they just totally wipe out all the men in this city of Gibeah, not just the evil men, but the men that were defending the evil men and not handing them over. And so, in a way, justice is served, but then Israel goes, wait a minute, what have we done? The land of Israel is given to us, the 12 tribes of Israel, and now we've just wiped out all of the sons of Benjamin, right? We, and there's, there's nobody there, and they feel bad. We've, we've done the wrong thing. So, um, they say, well, there, there's some young men there still. Uh, we need wives for them because we can't wipe out an entire tribe. That's against God's will. Right? Now, now they come to their senses. And uh, they call for, uh, they go, okay, who, who didn't go to battle with us? And they find out that there's one city that didn't go to battle, Jabesh Gilead, the same place that now Nahash, the Ammonite, is put up, you know, siege works around or however he's, he's there. So they find out that this city didn't go out to battle. And so here's what they do. They go, well, let's show them. Let's return evil for evil. They go there and they slay the men. They slay the women who were old enough to have been with a man. And they take 400 virgins from Jabesh Gilead. And I know it's terrible. Uh, they take them and they give them to the sons of Benjamin so that that tribe isn't cut off. Because they were the one tribe when the Civil War happened that didn't send any men. And they go, well, we'll show you. We'll show you. We'll destroy you. And so now, this is, I don't have a timeline. I don't know how we could figure that out uh, offhand. But now we have a town called Jabesh Gilead, whose all of the men have been wiped out. All the adult women have been wiped out. And we have just a very scarce town. So it still has walls as a town, whatever it had. And it has at least elders there and some men. Now, this Nahash, he sees that they are, they are very weak. And he says, I'm going to take your town. Enough, there must be enough of a wall there. Whatever it is, he was just, just looking for an opportunity. I would like to come and take your town that is already weak because your own people Israel came and destroyed you because you weren't faithful to do your part. And so they are now put in a place where they have forgotten that they have a Savior. Now, we only just have to imply from ourselves because God made a covenant already with the people of Israel. He said to them, if you do these things, if you honor me, if you obey me, if you follow my rules, which will give you health and, and prosperity, I will send rain and you will, your wombs will, you'll bring forth children and your animal, animals won't miscarry um, and there will be prosperity. But everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And so Jabesh Gilead was one of those towns, doing what was right in their own eyes. And so then they, uh, they did not have prosperity. And then through this very unfortunate turn of events, Nahash sees that they are vulnerable. And he goes there to them, and there is this ultimatum. Make a covenant with me, um, or else I'll, and I will, put out your eyes and be a reproach on Israel. So now, we start to see how this is a reproach on Israel. They had a promise. If they kept the covenant with God. You see, some hundreds of years before this, God made a covenant with Abraham. 
He cuts covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham is put into a deep sleep, and there's this smoking oven and a, and, and a lamp, and, and God says to Abraham, take an animal and cut it in two. They're cutting covenant. It is a blood covenant. It is saying this is how serious this, this agreement is. So Abraham cuts the animal. He divides it. God puts Abraham into a deep sleep, and then God passes through uh, the midst of this animal saying, I am serious about this covenant, and I will keep this covenant. Abraham, you're asleep in the whole matter. You obeyed to show the blood sacrifice side of this, but the keeping of the covenant, the promise of the land, the promise I'm giving to you is on my shoulders, the Lord would say. And so a covenant has been made. Unfortunately, these people in Jabesh Gilead, they did not keep their side of the covenant. But now God is raising up King Saul. And he's small Saul at this point. It's fantastic that he is, we'll see how this scenario works out. And this is how God works in us also. So Mr. I poking out has his threat there. Verse three, then the elders of Jabesh said to him, hold on for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel and then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul. So now, Gibeah is where Saul lived, and he had gone back to. Remember, he's anointed um, and, and appointed by Samuel as the king, and he goes back to Gibeah. And so the messengers come to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearing of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And so now... People, this is one of the things. God can work in me. God can work in pastoral leadership. God can work in a missionary. God can work in these people and they can be passionate. They can do everything they can that, that God calls them to do. But until there is leadership who will lead in a godly manner, and as Saul was surrounded by valiant people, and here we see the people now are weeping for the injustice. It, it takes more than... Charles Spurgeon. It takes more than a Jonathan Edwards. It takes people who have hearts that are sensitive to God and people who know God's word and who can, who can rightly say, this is an injustice. God's promise, God's covenant is being reproached by this man. And now I'll give you a, let the cat out of the bag. His name is not just Nahash, it's Nahash. Serpent. <laughs> Right? He is a picture of us, of uh, the devil, or from home alone, snakes. Snakes. Didn't we spend time with snakes? Right. In humor. So the guy's bad. He's got the name serpent. He's a picture for us of Satan, who, of course, wants to bring reproach on every one of God's covenants. And how does he bring reproach on a covenant from God? He scares us. And we forget that there's a covenant. So, this is happening. And when the people hear it, the people around Saul and Gibeah, they lift up their voice and wept. When God's people have a heart towards God's heart, when God's people are moved in a sensitive way towards righteousness, when we no longer just hear the news and go, eh, that's their problem. Eh, they didn't go out to war when it was the Civil War. They didn't join with, they deserve this. They got what they deserve. Oh, it's tough love. They deserve some tough love out there. I'll tell you, if God gave you the tough love that you deserve, you would not receive his grace and mercy. How will the world see the love of Christ if the church so often, and I hear it from people, oh, they need some tough love. There is times, but we love them and we let God be a father to them and God chasten them. When the church chastens people unjustly, healing doesn't happen. These valiant people around Saul and now the people who hear the words, they lifted up their voices and they wept. So now Saul, not only with a new heart in hearing this news, he sees that the people that God has appointed him to lead, not to rule over, but to lead, he has a heart for them. I gotta tell you, as a pastor, when I see God working in your lives, it makes, it, it's like, wow, God, why would you give a small flock indeed? <laughs> but why would you give me such a faithful flock? 
to lead. It's humbling to think that God puts you in a place where people want to hear from God's word. And not just to hear baloney and funny stories and things like that. But when God is moving in our midst, it is so humbling. And thankfully, in verse 5, we see that God meets humble Saul. Saul, before too long, is big in his own eyes. There it is. Saul, let's just look at it real quickly. Um, Samuel 15, verse 17. I'll just, just because it's, it's fun to remember this. I think, I hope I got it. Hmm. Ah, I got the wrong one down there. Oh, because I'm in 2 Samuel. No wonder I couldn't find it when I looked this morning. Sticky pages. There it is. I even underlined it. Remember this. Saul is going to be given a challenge with um, King Agag. This is, this is a future thing. But just remember this. And he does what's right in his own eyes. He sings that Tony Bennett song. Is that who it is? I did it my way. And that just doesn't work out. First Samuel, not second, 15, 17. Samuel said to Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of all the tribes of Israel? Okay, we have to remember this. Sometimes success comes our way. We have to be very careful not to get big in our own eyes. We'll just turn back to 1 Samuel 11, verse 5. It says here, though, that now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field, right? He was shepherding. When David is called, he's shepherding. Jesus Christ is the archaepoimen, the great shepherd of the sheep, Peter says. I like that, archaepoimen. He feeds his flock. He tends his flock. He observes his flock. He loves his flock. And when people are called in the Old Testament, they are called from shepherding because a shepherd, uh, they have to be so gentle. There's not dog shepherds, are there? Right? There's the dog whisperer guy. But if you're going to train dogs, you sometimes got to be a little brutal. Sheep, they don't respond well to that. Saul was little in his own eyes. He returned back to Gibeah, and he is shepherding his father's flock, whatever it may be, but he's behind the herd. And he heard from the field, and Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this vow, and his anger, a righteous indignation, if you will, was greatly Aroused. Remember, Ephesians 4.26 tells us that we can be angry, but don't let it become sin. Saul is moved by the Holy Spirit here, and he's angered. You know, today we're going to go and listen to CareNet and some pro-life conversation and things like that. Oh, that the life of the unborn was always before us, right? If we could always remember that, that we would be just so moved by the idea of how horrible, how horrific, how unhumane, It is the idea of taking a human life. And there is in us an indignation, and it never comes to us like those in Judges 20 and 21 who took up the sword in opposition of this. But we take to our knees. We take to prayer. We take to giving to different organizations that defend the sanctity of human life. We move in those ways. Well, the people are moved. Saul is moved. God's Holy Spirit is moved and comes upon Saul now to lead the people. And anger is aroused in him. And so he takes a yoke of oxen. Thank God. He didn't do like they did in Judges where they took a human being and they did this. He sends out a a very strong message and he doesn't threaten the people. You better join me or this will be you. He says, join me or this will be you. Your oxen. So verse 7, so he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle. So he says, I need God's, I need God's guidance in this. 
I need Samuel along. So Samuel's probably like, what? Hey, <laughs> I don't want to go do this. Saul and Samuel, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. So now the people are moved together in, in unison, and they are ready to move and help out the people of Jabesh Gilead. You see, the people of Jabesh Gilead had forgotten um, that God is on their side, that God had a covenant with them already. You know, it says, Romans 8, 31, that what shall we say to these things? That if God is for us, who can stand against us? God is moving and he is for them. He, he wants them to repent and believe in him. And now he's going to send salvation. And so the people are together with one consent. They have God's heart. They're moving in a good way. Verse 8, when, when he numbered uh, them at Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. And they said to the uh, messengers who came, thus you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. This is pretty cool. Then the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. 